Hi, my name is EJ Massa. I've been doing a few modding projects lately, and one of the big ones was modding a huge floor model Sony Trinitron to have an RGB SCAR input. That was a fantastic experience and really improved the picture quality on this almost three decade old television. However, I realized I wanted to have multiple consoles hooked up to it at the same time and the ability to capture the footage simultaneously for streaming and other video concepts like my top 10 lists. So I did some research and got this Games Care 8 and 2 Smart SCART Switch. This device is great. It automatically switches when you power on the console. It has an app so you can have custom labels for each input and it has two outputs so I can run one output to the TV and one to the RetroTINK 4K for easy game capturing simultaneously. The only problem is I want Nintendo 64 hooked up to it, and the Nintendo 64 doesn't natively output RGB. The best I can do is S-Video, and you know, I'll be honest, I think S-Video looks great, and you don't need RGB on the N64. In fact, the Sony Trinitron I have here does have S-Video, and it also looks great. But I'm lazy. So lazy, I don't even want to switch inputs to play in 64. I want it hooked up to my SCART switch. So, like any good lazy person, I'm going to invest more time and money into solving this problem. Look, it's hard enough to find time to sit down and play games as an adult with young children. I need every minor speed bump removed so I can drift effortlessly into playing games. Any barrier, and then I give up and fall asleep on the couch scrolling through my phone. So here's the Nintendo 64 in question. It's my childhood Nintendo 64 I got on Christmas morning in 1996. As you can see, I slathered it in stickers I got from a Pokemon player's guide. But you'll notice at some point I got embarrassed by them and tried to peel them off. But apparently I got too lazy to finish the job. Laziness is, I guess, a theme here. Plus at this point in my childhood, I'd never heard of Goo Gone. Opening up this slot here and you'll see it has the expansion pack which came with Donkey Kong 64. I was hesitant to mod my childhood system, but why be sentimental when you can make content out of it? I must have really liked putting stickers on things because check out this Walmart smiley face on Mario 64. That's pretty funny too, because when I put it on, that was the last time I was truly happy. Alright, enough blabbing. It's time to start the mod. So I took the console into my workshop and first things first, we'll remove this expansion pack which has been nestled into my system since Christmas of 1999. I pulled it out with a pair of tweezers and I can't believe the last time I laid hands on this, I was a smelly 14 year old. We'll set that aside and deal with the security screws on the bottom. I got these Nintendo screwdrivers on Amazon over 10 years ago. I think they go for like eight bucks nowadays for a set of them. After removing those eight screws, I removed the top cover, revealing some lovely shielding and a heatsink. Then using a regular Phillips screwdriver, I went around the perimeter of the shielding, removing those screws. Of note to myself, the ones closest to the cartridge are taller, so I made sure to set those aside. Then I removed these black ones up front, these silver ones holding down the inputs, and removed the short ones up here. Now this I didn't have to do, but I was chaotically dissembling this, so I removed all these tiny screws on the heatsink, and I removed it for no reason. Finally, there's tiny long screws near the expansion port, and I removed these with a number zero Phillips screwdriver. After that, these front pieces kind of fell off and you could lift up the shield. Oh, so that's what an N64 board looks like. This is my first time taking one apart. This is the part where the Nintendo multi-out connects into, and we'll need to solder a part onto here. And this is the part in question. It's the N64 RGB kit from Voltar, which will amplify an RGB signal, one of the chip's outputs, so that it's usable by a TV or upscaler. The installation is pretty easy. You just place it over the pins like so. Boom. That's like half the battle right there. I used the flux pen to help with the flow of solder, and then one by one I heated up the metal contacts with my soldering iron and fed in some solder. You don't have to solder every pin, just the ones that you see a shiny metal ring around. So yeah, I just went through, heated up the rings, fed the solder into it until all of those pins were soldered. 
I used my large dirty magnifying glass to check my work and touched up some of the connections that I thought were sketchy. The kit comes with installation wire and I stripped the ends and tinned for easy soldering. Again, I hit the RGB pads on the kit with a flux pen, tinned those contacts, and then I soldered the yellow wire to the red contact, which was the closest color to red that came in the kit. Then the others were more obvious, green to green and blue to blue on the end. We'll then solder the wires to this section here. You basically slide the other end of the wires into the vias labeled R10, R9, and R8. R10 is blue, R9 is green, and R8 is red. Now you may be wondering, what do you do with this S pad on the chip? Well, if you see these components on your board, you don't have to do anything. If those components aren't there, there's another step you must do, but I have those components, so I don't have to do anything. And one last step, take the shielding that rests on the underside of the board and bend this portion of the board so that it doesn't short the chip we just installed. If you don't bend this part, you could screw up your image. If you place the shield over, you'll see that now that I bent it, it doesn't hit the chip underneath. After that, I reassembled the whole thing. No screws left over. That's a good sign. Place the cover back on and we'll screw it into place. And inserted my Christmas of 1999 Donkey Kong 64 expansion pack. Perfect. I plugged in my Insurrection Industry SCART cable that I plugged into the system, into the Games Care SCART switcher, and turned it on. So the RGB mod was a success, and the SCART switcher automatically selects the input when the console is powered on. It also looks great. I'd say it looks about as good as S-Video. So like I said, if you have S-Video cables like the ones from Insurrection Industries, I don't think this mod necessarily does much for you video quality wise. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the N64 fed through a RetroTINK 4K. There's definitely a difference, but I wouldn't even call it better. <laughs> it's just different. I'll end this mod video with a short list of some of my favorite games. Super Mario 64. I mean, yeah, this list has to have that game. As my seven-year-old son says, Super Mario 64 feels good in my bones. That's a true story, and he said it unprompted. That was from his brain, and I couldn't have said it better myself. I'll follow that obvious choice with another obvious choice, Ocarina of Time. This game and its follow-up, Majora's Mask, redefined what a 3D adventure game was. Cinematic, played well, awesome puzzles, and giant memorable bosses. GoldenEye 007. I had countless get-togethers playing multiplayer on this game alone. Perfect Dark was a cool follow-up, but didn't match the charm of this game. This game introduced mission-based gameplay with these, these optional objectives, and I kind of missed that, that, that kind of game. Command & Conquer. I bought this game at a deep discount of $10 brand new at Electronics Boutique. I was a fan of the PC game, and I was kind of curious how they pulled it off on the N64. The result? They sort of did pull it off. They redid all the 2D assets from the PC game in 3D, so it has a unique vibe to it. Sure, it's easier to play with a mouse on a real computer, but I thought this was an inventive port. Doom 64. There were a ton of first-person shooter ports to the N64, and Doom 64 gets the most respect because it has its own unique maps, but not only that, its own unique sprite work. Looks great, and it sounds great. Love the extra mile they went to make it unique for the system. Star Fox 64. As far as I'm concerned, there really isn't any other Star Fox game. This game did it. This game did Star Fox, and every other game after it, okay, maybe it was okay, but this game did it. Mario Kart. Same comment as Goldeneye. This was the multiplayer game that caused and resolved all childhood disputes. Wave Race 64. This launch era game had really impressive water physics for its time. And then, after Mario 64 was long beaten, I would play Wave Race 64 over and over, perfecting my tricks, and getting best times. Resident Evil 2. This is the impossible port and truly a marvel of smart and savvy game programming. 
Check out the Modern Vintage Gamer video to see the details on how this game was squeezed onto a Nintendo 64 cartridge. Those are some of my favorites off the top of my head and combined with my EverDrive, I'm looking forward to finding even more favorites. Look, I'll, maybe I'll try, I'll finally, I'll finally try out Goemon. Everyone wants me to try Goemon. I hope you found this video useful or at least entertaining. That's all I have for today. Until next time, bye.